Third down and three. Green in an empty set. Green gets the snap. Big rush. Quick throw to the left side. McAllister caught at the 40. Sheds a tackle. 30. Left side. 20. Getting to the sideline. To the 10. He's going to dive, and he's going to be knocked out of bounds around the 7. Dubar behind Green in the pistol. Green gets the snap. Fakes it to Dubar. Throwing it long left side as McAllister. There! Over the shoulder catch. Touchdown, Eric McAllister. Touchdown, Boise State. I'll just address it, I think. Nobody was probably more proud of, of what Eric accomplished than me. I mean, he's come a long way and from his development through high school and, and to what he's done. I think the timing is the toughest thing. You know, for me, uh, my heart hurts. And just that we're talking about a guy that's up for the Bolitnikoff. He's 120 yards away from a 1,000-yard season. And those kind of seasons don't come often. You know, you can play football for a long, long time and not have that production. So I got a a lot of love for him, but the timing on this one hurts. Um, This is a resilient group. Uh, They've they've been through this, and by the nature of college football, uh, I'm sure it'll happen more and more. Well, what do we have to talk about today? Uh, Really, this show could go in any direction. This is Jay Sports Bar. I'm Jay Tuss, joined always by Shane Williams Rhodes, a legendary Boise State wide receiver. You have hyped up Eric McAllister all season long, and Eric has backed that up. He is one of the top receivers, not just in the Mountain West, but statistically, he's one of the best in the country. But news broke on Monday morning. We started to hear about it Sunday night. It was confirmed Monday morning that he is indeed leaving the Boise State football program. And when the transfer portal opens on December 4th, he will enter the transfer portal, likely with lucrative offers just sitting there waiting for him. Um, Shane, what is your initial reaction to the news of Boise State losing their leading wide receiver uh, with three games to go in the regular season? Um, Outside looking in, the first thing you think about is, you know, why not finish the last three games? Mm -hmm. Um, The transfer, it kind of throws a little wrench in some things because I feel like you lose – the accolades that you would have gotten. So I'm not sure how that works. I don't think you can get, you know, like an all-conference award when you don't finish the season I'm gonna, with that team. I'm going to guess it really uh, – either way, it's going to really hurt your chances because you're not going to be able to accumulate any more stats. He was added midseason to the Bolitnikoff Award watch list given annually to the top wide receiver in the country. Uh, he was one of the most targeted receivers in the country. He was one of the most explosive receivers in the country. 873 yards on 47 catches. For a guy that's been targeted 89 times, that average per reception is – is monstrous. You are more of a possession type guy, but Shane, that would easily double probably what you would average when yeah. you caught a pass in college. I think last time I saw it, he was like number two or three in the nation. Yeah, yeah. It, granted, you have to like uh, uh, certain qualifiers, mm-hmm. but yeah, he is he was right up there in yeah. terms of what what he brought to to that position. And um, but now they lose him, and you know don't want to like necessarily add to the rumors or anything like that, but the NIL era is real. In some ways, I think that Boise State and the city of Boise can learn, they can grow, they can adapt and, and uh, become resourceful with, with NIL. The bigger concern for me is collectives because that is essentially just a pot of money that you can pay guys to come play for your favorite school. I mean, that, that that's really what that is. Yep. And that is a, a pot of money that Boise State <clears throat> will never be able to compete with. Where they are right now is kind of uh, what the vibes were in December of 2013. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, everybody in the program was at Boise State because of Chris Peterson. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I know me personally, uh, there were some conversations when he came and sat in my parents' living room and how long were you going to stay and these things. But he ended up leaving. And so, what did he tell you? You know, he said he's going to wait till his son uh, graduates high school. So he didn't actually uh, finish that one out. That's a conversation for a later <laughs> date. <laughs> but so obviously, you know, that. But when he left, and then like we had, we're going through the bowl game process with no, with you know minimal coaches and no head coach, and like there was a state where it was a lot of us who were doing the same thing. that's happened now. Guys are looking to transfer. Mm-hmm. The NIL has changed everything so much because so then at that point, when that happened when we were there, for me it was like my thing was like, I want to go to Washington now. I want to go. I'm going to follow Pete. Like I know what I'm going to get if I go there. I don't know who's coming in. Even if it's someone who's been here before, I don't know that person. That person that didn't recruit me. You mm-hmm. know, He might not have the same standards. He might not have the same, you know, uh, you know, the way he just runs his football team. So 
we all were doing that. And there were some guys, you know, I don't want to say any specific names. I don't know if they want that out there. But there were some dudes who were, you know, looking and thinking about leaving. Maybe right. not even going to Washington because obviously quite a few of us didn't have, you know, the pedigree to just leave Boise State and go to Washington. So mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of us in the building you know, that was looming. You could tell who was looking to transfer, who wasn't. There mm -hmm. was guys who left. Uh, but obviously, based off the kids and the, the guys that played, most of us stayed. Yeah. Uh, but it's tough. But if you went through NIL back, back in, back that day, it would, we our whole team would have probably. Well, and, and that's what I want to ask you about. I want to get back to NIL in just a second here. We're going to hear from Andy Avalos on his thoughts on Eric McAllister transferring. Um, but – it, it's not just NIL, it's also the transfer portal. And the fact that now you can freely transfer one time without having to sit out a year. And that yeah. used to be a massive penalty. I mean, you didn't even redshirt, Shane. Yeah. When you may, might have been you know, weighing your options, it probably felt like, man, I'd have to sit out a whole year. That well, when, you're, when you're 18 years old, I that feels like an eternity. I, but you know what I did? I said, you know what, if I transfer, mm -hmm. I go to Washington, I can just redshirt. Yeah. I won't lose a year because I just redshirt because I never redshirt it. So I could use my red shirt year is what I was thinking in the process. So there was a lot going into it. But if you would have thrown money in back then, it's mm -hmm. just the amount of people who would have left. Because obviously we had enough talent to be really good because the next year we were really good. Next year, Brian Harson comes in. You guys yeah. go 12-2 and two and win a Fiesta Bowl. Yeah, we, we would have lost a lot. How many guys do you think? I mean, I, I, think I know you're just completely speculating right now. Let's just go starters. From the Fiesta Bowl team, you probably would have lost based off of money and like trajectory of like where people were, you know, were at. Like Jay Ajayi was his sophomore year, so mm -hmm. he only had one more year left that he was going to stay, and then obviously declare because of right. his body. But Jay Ajayi's coming off a of, what thirteen hundred yard sophomore yeah. season. So you know, you got to think about stuff like that, and like Matt Miller. You mm -hmm. know, Matt Miller was already an All American. He got like it was just so many dudes. Mm -hmm. It was like yeah, we would have had at least seven, eight starters out of the twenty two. So half the, half the starters were being That up. is why I, I will say this about Andy Avalos. He has the most difficult job right now of any coach that has ever filled that position over at the Boise State football facility. Yeah. I, on, on the flip side, I will say I think he also has more support than anyone over there because I think what Jeremiah Dickey is doing and um, the administration is, yeah. is phenomenal. It is easily the most – energetic and productive since I have been here, which is over a decade now. Um, but with some of the rules and the current circumstances of college football, Andy's job is, is not easy. And I also think we're interesting, entering a very interesting three week window. Um, yeah, sure. The, the transfer portal, portal doesn't open until December 4th, right? Yep. But you know, if you look at like national signing day, now there are rules and regulations to this, but if it's February 4th, yeah, co coaches don't start recruiting you on February 4th, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, these three weeks are going to be very interesting. With the NCAA not doing anything about tampering, you're going to see a lot, of the, a lot of those money, those Power 5, Power Money programs now start to kind of try to pick and choose of the elite players in the group of five or the schools that don't have that type of cash flow. Mm -hmm. And they're going to make it very interesting for them, even though, like I said, right now it is technically tampering. But if, if the yeah. NCAA is not going to monitor it, um, then, then it's going to happen because you're, you're not going to be a big program and then all of a sudden, okay, we'll start doing our work December 4th. If you do that, yep. yeah, Eric McAllister's already gone to another school or, or somebody mm -hmm. else has already committed to another school. And the outside looking in, because I know a lot of people are like, well, if you know your players are getting recruited because the season's not going the way you think, mm -hmm. then, you know, why don't you just, you know, say something. But as a head coach mm -hmm. in the NCAA – it's kind of one of those things like, do you want to be the coach that's, you know, t t t telling on other coaches that mm -hmm. they're recruiting your guys? Like, because the way coaching works is you might get fired and mm -hmm. that coach that you just tried to tell on might be the next opportunity you can go get another job. Right. And everyone knows everyone in the coaching world, so you can close so many doors doing it. And uh, it's just a tough situation. Another reason why I think that the NCAA is going to fail, your, fail to monitor this stuff um, is because, which is funny because they always penalize programs for failure to monitor things. Um, recently in, in the NIT, the, so the, the secondary tournament to the NCAA tournament, March mm -hmm. Madness in basketball, um, they changed some rules, which allows uh, a more convenient path for power five teams to get to their tournament which is unfortunate because it takes away you know like if, if a 
25 and 8 St. Bonaventure team that's really good is going to get passed up by a 14 and 16 yep. Clemson team. I mean, complete hypothetical. It's the old group of five problem. It is. And the reason why the NCAA is doing that is because the NCAA wants to exist. And if they start, you know, upsetting and agitating the power programs, mm -hmm. which have all the money, then guess what they're going to do? They're going to make moves to just say, you know what, yeah. we're going to do this on our own. We're going to commission our own leagues. We're not going to even deal with you. I think it applies to, to football as well. Like, the NCAA doesn't care what Boise State thinks. The NCAA cares what Alabama thinks. The NCAA cares what LSU thinks. Michigan, that's why you it, haven't seen that Michigan come down it, Exactly. They, they don't yeah. care what, what Boise State thinks or Utah State or really any program in the Mountain West probably. They're not, they're yeah. not, they're not going to move to uh, correct wrongs for those schools. As long as the big dogs are happy, then maybe they'll be happy with us and we're just going to let yeah. it go on. It, it's crazy how much their involvement has changed because I just don't feel like they really do much of anything now. As long as we're talking about it, let, just let James Madison into, the, into a bowl game, by the way. They're undefeated. They could be pushing for a New Year's Six bid. And because they're transitioning up from FCS to FBS, they're not going to be allowed to. That's like the dumbest rule ever. Maybe there's something there that I don't know or I'm not thinking about. Yeah. If you were going down, yeah, sure, penalize somebody. But if you're coming up, yeah. that's just the dumbest rule ever, in my opinion. Um, that's not a really topic for this podcast, but um, just my, my thoughts on the NCAA. So kind of roping it back to NIL. And we asked Andy Avalos to share his thoughts on Eric McAllister's departure. And he definitely thinks that Eric's decision was influenced by somebody outside of the Boise State football program. It's a part of college football right now is to go to transfer portal. You know, there's teams that are enticing people to do such things like this. The nature of the beast right now. Is it right? It's not right. You know, as we said um, when we left the locker room um, after our last game is that we're going to be all in and we're going to move forward and we're going to work together and it's going to provide opportunities and guys are going to thrive down the stretch here as we go. Again, it's the nature of the beast when uh, you got guys who, you know, are approaching a thousand yards over the course of the season and, uh, you know, walk out, you know, because of other opportunities. As we go into this next uh, season and into this next uh, phase of recruiting, that is a huge part of college football now. You know, the, the nil space is a, a huge part. We've done a great job recruiting. We've got some great young talent. We're going to continue uh, to recruit great young talent. You know, the nil space is going to need to take care of uh, Boise State. And that's just the nature, nature of what college football is. I think it is appropriate and the right, you know, framework that student athletes, you know, get to receive money and get to be a part of that space. I think that's, that's pretty cool. How Boise State is able to use that space as a lot of other people are in college football is gonna be a big deal for our success and not only being able to retain our players, which we're really excited about. There's a lot of people that are very interested in working those nil deals with players. My personal opinion on this, Shane, is I definitely think that there were more factors than just NIL and money that, that somebody might be uh, using to court Eric McAllister's services. I, I, I think there's more to it. That being said, there's no doubt that money can influence this. And if a certain school from back in your home state were to offer you a, a lucrative deal that they can't touch here at Boise State, I'm going back and I'm trying to think of NIL deals that Eric McAllister might have had at Boise State. And the only one that I know for certain was the Jackson's card deal. And basically every, every player on the team benefited from that. Eric was one of the select 10 that had autographed cards and had, some, had, had a little bit more to that deal. But from what I know, the guy that is second in the Mountain West in receiving yards leads your team in receiving yards by like 600 when it comes to fellow wide receivers. That was pretty much it. And so that, that's – I look at it that way and I'm like, man, if a kid can go get a couple hundred thousand dollars, like I – how do you fault him for that? We call that he's playing for the love of the game. <laughs> That's what he's doing I, right now. I mean, I, I don't know if I intended to ask ask you this question, Shane, but I mean, I, I don't feel like this this think about how much uh, offenses and defenses have evolved in the last fifteen years, right? Well, I think our our view of college football and character can also evolve, and I get, hey man, loyal. Loyal to the soil, blue and orange, I bleed blue, all this stuff. It absolutely plays, and I get it. But I would also question somebody's, you know, um, decision-making skills. If, if somebody was going to offer them 500000 a million dollars to go play somewhere else when you can maybe, maybe get like a, a free car and some, mm -hmm. some free 
you know, food here. I mean, it's no longer the same. Like we like we talked about about I, I said, me saying that all those guys would have left mm-hmm. uh, when we were playing. Um, but we did we did not leave mm-hmm. because the basis of our you know of our decision was relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, the guys that you've been playing with. But now it's not the 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 decisions aren't now made off of relationships mm-hmm. and you know the bond now. I mean, I hate to tell y'all, but it's a business now. It is. It absolutely is. Each player is their own business, mm-hmm. so you have to do what's best for your business because, obviously, you playing here, and if you're making that, you know, obviously nothing. You're playing for the love of the game here, and then you can go back home to Texas and play in front of your family every mm-hmm. week. You can obviously make a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess we should say a lot about a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just economically it does not make any sense to stay which that's the hard part it's it's just changed it's not the same mm-hmm. and it sucks it really does suck because now everyone thinks they have the right answer on how things should go um like i mean i throw my wife out there she hates the nil deal so she's like there should be a salary cap and like this i said you know what you have a great point i i do agree with that because Hey, players can get it, totally, mm-hmm. but the NFL has a salary cap, the NBA yep. has a salary cap. Like More so than that being about even the players, that's about these programs mm-hmm. that have endless pocketbooks that can just create this insane competitive advantage. Now all of a sudden it's like, can we just like level, like even attempt to level a playing field even slightly? Yep, and then here's my combat tweet, because I always got to be, you know, play devil's advocate. <laughs> you know? I can't let her have a great point on me. <laughs> so what I, so what I do is I, I I shoot it back at her. I say, well, there was no salary cap when Laramie Tunsil was coming out and his mom's bills were getting paid. Mm-hmm. It was actually illegal. It was exposed. They had messages, mm-hmm. but it was happening. You know, so having the salary cap, you can't control it because the money isn't getting paid by the university. Right. The university is not dispersing the money. So mm-hmm. who's to say that Albertsons doesn't come and drop $50,000 on your front porch in the bag? <laughs> it's it's not. It Could nothing. you do that? It no, does <laughs> not affect the salary cap yeah. because it's not on paper. You I know? hear you. So it's like, it, I mean, the same thing with NFL. Yes, they have a salary cap. But you can't tell me John Lynch isn't signing some of those players and getting some extra endorsement deals out there from other right. you know, his resources. Other, his, you know? other, his other rich buddies. Yeah, there's other ways yeah. to compensate a player. That's a really good deal. You know? A really like, good idea. I never thought about that. Thought like about there's like other that. ways. Money is coming in from mm-hmm. somewhere. There's yeah. no way you tell me John Lynch has gotten all these players the last yeah. few years right. through, you know. I mean, he's got, what, Trent Williams and uh, he just got from the commanders. He's got, you know, the DN. Mm-hmm. He's got both of them for third, third round picks. Yeah. There's no way. Mm-hmm. Something else is coming in. Well, I, I, I just, I'm just going to ask you direct here, Shane. So if you were if, if you were coming off your sophomore season in today's rules, right? Mm-hmm. Your sophomore year, you had 77 catches. That was tied for 20. Or, yeah, tied for 28th most in the country. You had 702 uh, receiving yards, six touchdowns. All of those numbers on a smaller scale in the Mountain West Conference were were near the top of the league. Um, if you were coming off a season like that. And TCU said, hey, Shane, what do you think about coming back to Texas, playing in front of your home state? We'll throw 100 k your way. And you don't have to sit out, by the way, because those are the rules. You can play immediately for us. I don't know if we can guarantee you, by the way, like an exact starting position, but you're definitely going to be in the mix to be a contributor on our offense. And TCU just went to the Natty the year before? Mm-hmm. Jay, that's that's a tough question. <laughs> Sir, the, the, is Coach Pete gone? Okay, well, let me ask you this, Shane. If, go, if well, Coach if, Pete's if, gone, that you know, changes things. You, you know, know, Shane, you really sound like you're hung up right now. <laughs> How about um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call a couple people. We're going to go 200,000. Yeah, Jay. I Once again, to go back to economics. <laughs> How do you say no to that? I don't know how you say no to that. How do you, as a 19-year-old kid, how do you say no to $200,000 and going to go home? Oh, I got one more stipulation, though, for you, Shane. By the way, I am speaking completely in hypotheticals right now. Um, there's three games to go in the season. I, I, we really think you could help us out next year. This is a physical game. You know, you did have that high ankle sprain earlier in the year, which that might be that might hit home because you did deal with in- ankle injuries. I think we're just hitting <laughs> home with all this. We're from Texas, it's TCU. Right. You know, it's... So I, I don't know if I want you to play in these final three games. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if your team's going to a bowl game. 
Jay, you're just, it's it's tough. <laughs> You know. Hey, I'm 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 it's, just trying to present what these kids at, at 20, 21 years old are being faced with, and I, this some of this might sound like hypotheticals, and it certainly is in this moment. But I guarantee you, if it's not at Boise State, these are realities at other Power Five programs. I mean, this stuff is happening behind the scenes. It is as crazy, it is crazier behind the scenes than what is even being presented in in the public eye at this point in time. I think if that was presented to me as the 19 year old kid that was in Boise, Idaho mm -hmm. in 2013, I there, I don't see how I could say no. No. Because, I mean, Jay, we couldn't even go to Olive Garden. Like me and my wife would go to Olive Garden and guys, people would pay for our bills. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we're all, the old rule followers, we have to leave the same amount as the tip. Mm -hmm. I can't even go out and get a free meal, but you're gonna offer me $200,000? Why wouldn't I leave? <laughs> It's just, it's tough. It is. And um, that's just the reality of the situation that some of these kids are being faced with right now. So it's, it is unfortunate. I mean, we're, we heard from Bush Hamden, like the timing sucks. The timing sucks for everybody. I guarantee the timing sucks for Eric McAllister. Like uh, it, it's yeah. not, it's not convenient for anybody, for but, sure. but it is with whatever is going on. It's the reality of the situation. I don't believe that his, his decision solely has to do with money. That again is 100% my opinion, but I do feel like it it absolutely can help influence someone's decision as well. Like if you are 50-50, if you're somewhere in the middle, ah, I like it here, but it's just okay. And then all of a sudden, says, you want 200K? Okay, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I talked to the uh, Boise State uh, guru slash troll this week on the phone, Elliot Hoyt, him, <laughs> him himself. Um, we had like a 15, 20 minute conversation and obviously it was not a great one, but mm -hmm. he said, he the way he broke it down was like, yeah, we had the same stuff happen to us, and but even, you know, when you were going through rough stuff when we were at Boise State, winning fixes everything. Winning fixes everything. So when the culture, mm -hmm. you know, and things were getting a little lopsided yep. and, you know, the balances were tipping, we were winning games. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when you win, uh, Obviously, everyone in the building's spirits are a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel a little better. You know, you're going to better bowl yeah. games. All these things. Yeah. It so, fixes okay. everything. Mm -hmm. But Let when me. you lose and things start not going your way, and then now, you know, it gets – it comes from the top, right? Because mm -hmm. Dickie has to put pressure on Avalos. So mm -hmm. Avalos has to put it on his, his coaches, and his coaches are putting it on the kids. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's just feeling the heat. Right yeah. Now. Let me ask you this. I'm gonna uh, let me present this offer to you in a, in a different way because I, I I am curious and I, I think that winning does matter. I think if Boise State was eight and one right now, yeah. then I think it would be different at least through the rest of the season. So, if TCU was coming off a seven and five campaign where they missed a bowl game, and Boise State was coming off a twelve and two season where they just won a Fiesta Bowl, returning a lot of talent that season, you have that same lucrative offer on the table. To go from TCU to Boise State? No, to go from Boise State to TCU. TCU is 5-7. and seven. They say, hey, we got money for it if you want to come here and try to help us win. But you're coming off a 12-2 and two season, won a Fiesta Bowl, and got a lot of talent coming. And, oh, by the way, a four-star quarterback from Spokane is set to arrive on campus here before too long, too, um, after you're coming off a 77-catch season. How much – does it make it any more difficult? Or are you still chasing that, chasing that bag? So I get the same offer, but I have a great team. You have a great team at Boise State. I probably stay. You would go to a bad team at TCU, but have money. I probably stay because if we won, like obviously, if 2014 happened mm -hmm. and then it was possible for it to happen again in 2015, mm -hmm. like if Grant Hedrick was coming back for yeah. 15, oh yeah, I'm staying because I, money will come. Because obviously, yeah. we bring in more money mm -hmm. when we win. Obviously, those Fiesta Bowls help a lot with the for the university, mm -hmm. but. Donors love that too. So that's who pays these NIL deals. I think I come back because I might not get 200000 but I'm going to get something. And you get something. Win. So yeah. you get money and win, or you get money and lose. And you get to stay with your buddies. Exactly. So uh, winning does affect, affect it for mm -hmm. sure. Well, now we, uh, Boise State just left to move on. They have to replace, again, Eric McAllister, 10th in college football with 89 targets. Uh, he was targeted more than any other receiver in the country on throws of 20 or more yards. He had 29 such targets. I'm curious, and this is going to sound like a funny question, Shane. Does a receiver ever get too many targets? 
That's that's no such thing. There's no such thing. Nope. Okay, just making sure. I've never heard of that. Okay, just ma- I I just I'm just making sure that it, sometimes it. May, God, man, lots on my shoulders. They just keep throwing the ball my way, and every time I'm expected to do something spectacular. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone complain that. Okay, dumb question. No. I'm just saying at times, uh, Eric did look a little lethargic at times last game. 19 targets. That's just my opinion too, but I'm 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 just yeah. gonna speak my opinion. Moving forward, Boise State's got to find a way to uh, to replace this guy, though. And it seems like the time has arrived for true freshman Prince Strawn as well as uh, Bora High alumnus yeah. Austin Bolt. Yeah. He's finally healthy, and now there is opportunity. Yep. What do you think? I think this is great. I mean, it opens up scholarships for guys. It opens up opportunities for guys. Uh Especially love it when it's the local guys, you know, the kids mm-hmm. you get to see playing high school yep. here. And I think, like you said, I think Prince is probably that guy that has to step into that role. Mm-hmm. But I think Austin can help you in some other spots. Mm-hmm. So I think when I was watching on TV, they called him a tight end. So uh, <laughs> he's a big kid. He can And he can run. But, uh, yeah, I think you can find some mismatches with Bolt. Matson in the shotgun, Halani with him, Penry in motion left to right. Matson rolls the pocket right, throws back to the left. He's got his man. That's Austin Bolt with his first catch. Bolt inside the 10, and he's going to be wrestled out of bounds somewhere around the 5. He had this crazy, unfortunate injury at Oregon State in the season opener last year, breaks his leg. He's working on coming back from that. It looks like he's good to go during fall camp, but then all of a sudden some swelling, something comes up. He has a setback, and all of a sudden he's not on the field. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, where is he? Because Boise State doesn't really talk about injuries, we weren't really clued into some of that stuff until somewhat recently. But this week we asked Andy Avalos to share his thoughts on Austin Bolt, who might now be playing a significant role in his offense. Between him and Prince have had experience playing that position. And so Austin, in the last couple of weeks, has really come on and had a big catch in last week's game. We care about him having a quality experience as he works back in and has an impactful experience. And so there are some things that we got to be very mindful of uh, with Austin um, as he jumps back in there. Um, so he is going to be, you know, a part of the mix now and he's, he's ready to go, but let's all know we got to be very smart about how we do this in terms of taking care of his body. And, you know, as he works back in, he's, he's, uh, he got in the last game and made, made a nice play, which is awesome to see. Uh, we all felt pretty confident that last week was going to be the week when he got his first catch and he was going to be able to do something. And he was, you know, about a yard from being staying in bounds on a stiff arm and, and scoring a touchdown, which would have been awesome for him, uh, given all the things that, that he's been through. And uh, we just want to see him continue to grow and have fun and thrive, and the rest will take care of itself. The thing that I love about Austin Bolt is he is just a gamer. Like, he doesn't necessarily look like he would show up and be the fastest person on the field, but he mm-hmm. oftentimes is. Yep. In high school, which I know is vastly different than, than college football, he would play whatever position his team needed him to play. If it was wide receiver, he would go out and run routes. If it was quarterback, he'd stand in the shotgun and do that. If it was play safety, uh, he would do that. Sometimes he would do all three in a game, and he also did punt return and kickoff return. He was – I don't say this lightly. Um, I would put him in my top three of toughest football players at the high school level that I've covered in my time here at Boise State. That guy was a warrior. Yeah. He took a ton of hits for that team and just kind of kept on coming back. And it was funny. I heard a story about um, Austin Bolt and the recruiting process. And um, there was a coach that went out to watch him play a basketball game because football season was wrapping up. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go watch him play basketball. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and apparently kind of during warm-ups, um, again, he's just finishing up football season, so he's probably sore as can be. Mm-hmm. He didn't really do a lot during warm-ups. And the coach was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. Once the ball went up, there was not a loose ball in the entire game that Austin Bolt wasn't the first to the floor to. And that, that's just like him, man. Toughness, yep. grit, uh, that, that is him. And so, yes, I am very excited to see what Prince Strong can do as his role expands. But I really, I'm a believer. I, I think Austin Bolt can provide something to this offense. I don't think it's going to be to the point where it's like Emac who because he was really, really good. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like peak Austin Bolt. I think that that I, I don't know if the gap is as big as some might think it is. Agreed. Just, just my opinion. I, I definitely agree. He's a Matt Miller type guy. He is. <laughs> He's just yeah, tough, hard nose. Yeah. 
he's gonna he's gonna get in there. He'll block his ass mm-hmm. off for you. Like I mean, he'll do stuff like that. Yeah, I I think it's a I think he's gonna have some good games, and especially who with who we have left on the schedule. Mm-hmm. I think he has some opportunities to go make some plays. He's he's tall. He knows how to go get it at the highest point. And I, I, more than anything, I just think Austin's hungry too. Like I, I think he is ready for this and. Um, heck, I could say it or I could let him tell you how he feels about it because we did catch up with Austin Bolt for the first time in a long time this week. Take a listen. It's God's plan, God's timing. You know, right away, right when I'm actually fully cleared, like I get to get moved up in that position. So I think um, everything happens for a reason, and I'm here to ready to help the offense on whatever they need me, catching, blocking, you know, doing anything that they want. Um, I think that um, it's – it's honestly really like it's like if it's a good encouraging feeling when you have that much work in for the last 14 months to finally like be able to step up and be why I was back pre- prior to Oregon State. I know that like when you look at Eric McAllister's production, that is going to be that, that's it, that's going to be very intimidating to replace. Again, 47 catches, 873 yards, five touchdowns, all by far the team lead um, for anybody that's catching passes over there at Boise State. I also think there's like an impact he makes to this team that isn't necessarily charted by any type of stat. Boise State has made it known they want to run the football. And at times they have ran the football very, very, very well this year, especially when Ashton Genty has been available. And even when George has been back these last couple of games, they've been a pretty efficient in the run game. Um, that means that a lot of opposing defenses have wanted to stack the box. Well, when you have a deep threat like Eric McAllister – he makes you at least think about him, right? Mm-hmm. Like maybe you ca- you do have to pull a safety over there, or you may- you probably just do feel a little uneasy just leaving him one on one and bump and run all game or anything like that. So he 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 has a presence, right? How how do they have that presence to not only where you're worried about replacing his production, but you're worried about replacing his presence because his presence helped the other 10 guys on the field on offense at that, you know, when he was out there. Well, having Prince and having Austin helps because Prince obviously is probably taller and, mm-hmm. you know, more lengthier. By a little He's, bit, yeah. Yeah. And so he can, let's say he fills in for Emac. Well, now on the other side with you having Bolt being healthy, he's fast mm-hmm. and he's tall. Mm-hmm. So you can stretch it kind of on both ends now. So it might help us out. You know, this might be, a, you know, a diamond in the rough for us. Might with losing one, we might have found two. It hey, could be one of those situations. Boise State is supposed to be a developmental program, right? We are going to get to see if yeah. if players are developing behind the scenes this weekend against New Mexico. I mean, that's 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 the reality sure. of it. Because you're going from a guy. I added this up earlier this year, or earlier this week. It's something along the lines of um, Eric McAllister played something like five <clears throat> five hundred and. 49 snaps I believe this year and you go back down to the depth behind him um, I believe it's Prince Strawn has played 94 snaps and uh, Austin Bold is somewhere in the range of 46 snaps so again from 549 to 94 and 46 that that's that is yeah. some big time shoes to fill and um I mean, your, your conditioning is getting tested at that point, too. Yep, and I think with only being three games, you got to focus more on using those younger guys, you know, and get them some experience mm-hmm. than trying to lean again on your seniors who haven't shown up for you yet. It's tough, but, my, man, is it – I feel like I, I am of the same mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's only gotten you to four and five, right? Yep. Time to try something new. You know, if – you know, the definition of insanity. Yes, and I feel like we've kind of lived in that for uh, a, a little bit this this year. Um, I did want to get here from um, Bush Hamden, the offensive coordinator at Boise State, because I wanted him to weigh, on, weigh in on, um, again, replacing that, not necessarily even just the production, but the presence of Eric McAllister in his offense. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think we will need it. You guys know that. Anytime you become one-dimensional, it's not a good thing. But again, the reason he was probably the most targeted guy and with the yardage he was targeted was because of how tight things were. Uh, and again, you know, certainly a strength that Talens has been throwing the deep ball. Again, a lot of this is, right, this is this is what we're here for and our main job. You got three, four days to kind of put together who's going to be in there, what it's going to look like, and uh, we're looking forward to that challenge. So clearly Austin Bolt, Prince Strawn, and company are going to have a chance to play more and, and try to rise to the occasion this Saturday against New Mexico. We are going to preview the Lobos in, in just a second, but like we always do, we, we want to recap – the game that happened this past weekend against Fresno State. Nobody was going to be surprised if Boise State went down there and lost. 
They were yeah. the underdogs. Like, I mean, they, they were legit. Vegas said, nah, you, Fresno State's three points better than you. We think they're winning this game. I think the thing that's kind of frustrating walking away from that is, like, is how much I feel like they left out there again. It's the and way you lost. It's the way you lost. And the, the, the play for me that frustrates me beyond measure is what happened at the end of the first half. And you're, you're kind of sitting there watching this game, right? And you again, he's like, oh, wait, if they can do this, and then if they can do this, they're actually right back in this game. And those ifs were, if they can get a stop here and go down and score, they also get the ball back before half. Heck, you didn't even need a touchdown. Just even a field goal would have been great. Mm -hmm. They score the touchdown. It's a 13-10 ball game. There's under 10 seconds left in the half. Get this thing to the locker room. Kick off the second half, and you got a chance to go out. Despite the fact the first half wasn't exactly pretty, you had two turnovers down inside the red zone. You could still go out and take a lead here and, and really deliver a gut punch to the Bulldogs who failed to capitalize on their opportunities. Instead, somehow they go down, they go in the locker room down 10. Yeah. yeah. That, that kickoff was just, it's, it's got to be inexcusable. I know Andy said after the game, the way they kicked it, that kind of pooch kick, he, he felt like it went a little bit too far. You still have to be able to cover it, though. Yeah, no matter what. And I was tweeting out, like, man, this is perfect. They get the ball in the second half, ideal scenario. And just kind of knowing the, this team. And their, their inability to really grasp and hold on to momentum for super long periods of time. Um, I was at the Colorado State game. I was at the beginning of the, the San Jose State game. And granted, they got the momentum back in that one, but you can just feel it at times. And I kind of thought to myself, well, as long as they don't allow a kickoff return here. I didn't, I didn't tweet that, but I thought yeah. it. And then it happens. And so that's why like, I wasn't even that surprised by it, Shane. Like, I really wasn't yeah. even that surprised by it. it. To me, it's just that was literally that kickoff. Basically explain the entire game. Mm -hmm. Get to third and three, boom, twenty yard gain. You get them to third and twelve. They like they were converting so much. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the final number ended up being. They were they were up. They had a lot of third down. Uh, the, they had a lot of third down opportunities, and they still converted at like a fifty percent rate. I think they were eight of sixteen, somewhere in that range. Nine of nine, nine of eighteen, something like that. Just like we can't get off the field, no. and then <clears> we get to third down, and we can't convert, and mm -hmm. it's just time after time. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it's just we don't. I feel like when we get into those situations, it's like we're not a really good situational team. Mm -hmm. You know, we play, you know, you do your job on first and second down, and then you get to third, and it's like, all right, the lights are on now, and now everyone's watching us, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we just. Who's uh, who's responsible? Who does it fall on to be a good situational team? You know, that, that does fall on the coaches. But then I look at things like, so let's go to Taylor's pick. Mm -hmm. So Taylor threw an interception. The mm -hmm. receiver ran a go route. Yep. Uh, the cardinal sin of running a go route is taking an inside release. You don't take an inside release because if you take an inside release, the cornerback is now on your outside. Well, guess who's on the inside of you? The safety. Mm -hmm. So now you are sandwiched, which means you have a quarterback that has to throw it in between two defenders. So we're taught, you know, I, it's ideal to take an outside release because guess what the quarterback coaches do? They teach the quarterback, throw it to mm -hmm. the outside shoulder yeah. where only your guy can get it or it goes out of bounds. Right, the, that, that out of bounds is, a, is also a defender, but that defender can't intercept a pass. Exactly. <laughs> it's an incomplete. We get the ball, but we still have the ball. Yeah. Well, we go inside on a go route. So now they're taught, leave it on the outside shoulder. Well, as a football player, I understand if my guys were inside, I can't leave it on the outside shoulder or I'm going to throw it right to the corner. So guess what we do? We throw it to the inside and a little short to try to put our guy. Guess what? Interception. Mm -hmm. It's just like things like that. It's like you see it so much, just so much. That's why I love you, Shane, because I see that as a slightly underthrown football. <laughs> so <laughs> no, they, someone they, actually they, asked me about that. Thank you for your that. knowledge. And I said, well, as a receiver, I'm going to say he should not have went inside. Hmm. It's not good. He's not helping the throw. Yeah, that's why we love your insight on this game, man. I'm just asking ask you, as you're, if you're a quarterback, where do you put that ball? Honestly, Shane, <laughs> I don't even pay attention to my receiver probably, <laughs> and I just think I'm trying to put that thing outside. You know, I, I, but I'm, the I DB just, was outside because right. he went in. Yeah, so it kind of screws you. Okay, uh, only because we talk about it every show. Again, the quarterback situation. Oh. Taylor starts. He comes off the field this very second play. Um, when you when you script plays. How many plays are you on offense are usually kind of scripted out for that that first part of the game? Do you go fifteen deep ish or ten or where where are you D at? Different OCs. I've seen a lot of different ways, but okay. most go like ten to twelve. Ten to twelve. Okay, 
Does that include personnel usually? Absolutely. Okay, so you can tell me Taylor Green's the starter, but when he comes off the field for the very second play, that was absolutely the script. That's absolutely the script. I've seen per, I've seen seven different personnel with a ten play script before. So <laughs> that's just that's just what I mean, man. Like we're told one thing in a Monday press conference, and I'm sitting there watching this game, and not only am I like that's weird that Taylor's coming off the field on the second play, but I'm like, it's the second play. That's probably scripted. And I believe if we go back and watch it. Uh, and I might do that to let you know. Mm-hmm. I bet you can watch the play happen and him just run straight out of the field. And, and already, not even look over the sideline, just know, like, I'm running my play and then I come off. Man. I bet. I can almost bet it. So, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen this week. Um, Andy Avalos, when asked about it in his press conference, was certainly less definitive. I'm just going to say I wouldn't be surprised if Maddox Matson starts. He's taken well over 70% of the actual game reps these last two weeks. Um, we – Bush Hamden told us last week that – Maddox was getting 25% of the snaps in practice. I asked Andy about it this week at the press conference. This is what he actually had to say. Take a listen. Somebody asked that the other day, and he had, he had brought it up to me that I was probably going to get asked in here. I don't know where the confusion came in on that, but uh, he definitely gets more than 25 snaps, 25% of the snaps at practice. That doesn't even make sense. I don't know if that was in a particular um, situation, maybe at practice that 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 percentage came up but that is not that's not the percentage of which we obviously operate off of yeah i wasn't here for when that question or what that was said and that's a little bit where the confusion but that's that's obviously not the case bush said it last week maybe it was misinterpreted maybe he was talking about a very specific package or something i don't know i think we it was pretty it was said pretty presented pretty literally to us so that's i i don't know why we would interpret it any other way than Maddox was getting 25%. My understanding is that it probably has been a little closer to 50-50 ever since, you know, prior to the San Jose State game when they have utilized this two-quarterback system. But also, Maddox Madsen, 41 pass attempts. Taylor Green, two. I mean, Maddox threw more passes in that game than Taylor has since this two-quarterback rotation started. If it walks like a duck. Exactly. I mean, so he's the starter. He's he's definitely getting the most passing attempts right now. If anything, it almost would seem weird to go back to Taylor because it's like, well, how much is he practicing? He's thrown <laughs> whatever twenty six balls the last uh, five weeks or whatever is, it is. Yeah, now six and six on TD. I didn't see. Yeah, yeah, he's still one to one. It's bad. It it, it just kind of how is. little that he's actually thrown the ball. And, and I think the thing that. Well, again, I, I don't know how many times I've said this. the thing that frustrates me. The, another thing that frustrates me is that we heard after you know Tim Plow exited last year, this was going to be like a personnel player driven type of team. Like we got to utilize our talents, mm-hmm. right? Are they did they utilize Taylor Green's talents? I not to the maximum. I, and the only reason why I point that out is like he was he was your starting quarterback. It mm-hmm. worked for the last ten games last year. I don't know. I'm being a little opinionated right now. It is what it is just because they're, it's hard to make it a line. I will say this. Maddox Matson's a little gamer, dude. Like, he, he does he does hang in there. He's tough. Um, I do think he's very intuitive, has a good football IQ. I love how he's the guy that's making an impact in the vertical run game. Like, uh-huh. he takes advantage of that space in the middle of the field. That He, had yeah. a, he did it on that 27-yard touchdown run that made it a three-point game and, again, got Boise State back in it and gave him a little bit of life. Uh, but I think for everyone involved, uh, it's not even a matter of execution anymore. It's just a matter of limiting distractions. Because isn't that like a like a number one goal too? Limit yeah. distractions. Well, this is the uh, technology <clears throat> era, so I don't know if that is even. A thing yeah, anymore. maybe it doesn't exist anymore because it's just impossible one way or the There's other. No some, somebody out there is going to have some opinion that's going to piss somebody off. They can go on Instagram and just get a good laugh and <clears throat> yeah, run into some. Boise State news. So right. So I don't know. Avoid it. I'm just ready to go with one and then let the other one play a compliment, but just call it what it is. Walks uh, like a duck, talks like a duck. It's a duck. Like, yeah. just, it is what it is. Let's just own it. Don't don't present it one way publicly and just do something completely different. Because I'll also say this, like, press conferences and stuff, fans watch it, players watch it, co- uh, parents watch it. Like, and if you say one thing and then you do another, I, I really do think it thinks, think that it creates like a really confusing situation. And, and back yeah. in the day when, you know, there were just so few people on social media, maybe it didn't matter, but now everybody is. And apparently if you have like a really creative, um, 
you know, Twitter profile picture or name or a blue check mark that you pay for. Now people think that you have valid points and you can just spew whatever. And then all of a sudden they're the media, but we're the ones that actually sit in front of these guys and it falls back on us. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm venting about my own personal <laughs> life. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the thing that I, I'll just leave you with that on that Fresno State game. That was a frustrating thing to me because it, it definitely felt feels like another game they could have won, they should have won. The old Boise State teams that wouldn't make not only wouldn't make errors but always seem to capitalize on your error. Yeah. That team probably wins by multiple touchdowns. Agreed. I, you're totally right. That's it. Was, it's, it's just really rough to look at. You know, we I, we've never seen Boise State be where we are right now. We play. we have not. You're right. We have not. It's not. It hasn't been a thing for. I, I can almost say it hasn't been a thing for almost 20 years. So it's tough. Well, how old are you now? Can I ask you that? Oh, we're getting up there, Jeff. <laughs> I, I can make you feel a lot better because I'm way older than you. I got about four days, Tw and I got the big 30. Oh, what? Yeah. Man, happy, happy birthday. Getting kind of old. Okay, man. so you were in kindergarten the last time Boise State, I don't even, depending on when you entered kindergarten, you still might have been yeah. preschool, uh, the last time Boise State had a losing season. 25 straight years of winning football here at Boise State, the longest active streak in the country, one of the longest streaks um, in college football history. And it is in jeopardy if they don't win um, at least three more games the rest of the way. Because even if they win two and they lose the bowl game, they still finish under 500 for the season. So they, they, they've got to figure out a way to win at least three games. Yeah. Moving forward now, there has been a lot of adversity thrown at the Boise State football team this year, clearly. There's been ton thrown at them lately, too. There's a lot of noise that is trying to probably get inside their heads and distract them. New Mexico comes to town this week. New Mexico is much improved over some of their previous year teams, but they are always a potential get right game. Can Boise yeah. State get right against the Lobos amongst all the chaos right now, Shane? It, for me, even as someone who's predicting, it's hard to predict when you don't know who the starting running back will be this week. You don't know who your starting receiver, like your guy, will be this week. And you don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be this mm -hmm. week. It's just so – so many things that are going on right now. There's just got, no way for me to know what personnel is even going to be on the field. You can even throw a tight end in there, too, because they were banged up last week to the point that we saw a lot of the third string tight end in Austin Terry. Um, everybody could see, you know, Riley Smith walking off the field with the sl yeah. his shoulder in a sling. So, like, I don't even know who's going to play. Right. Wow, it's, normally we get so much uh, confidence out of you. You know, I thought we were going to win out, so <laughs> I'm really, really hurting. A little skeptical. <laughs> really hurting right now. That is a lot of unknown going into the 10th game of the season. Yeah. And, 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 again, only so much of it has to deal with injuries. I mean, because I definitely think if Ashton Jensen plays last week. They win. Uh, we don't throw the ball 43 times. Yeah. We probably throw it 25. Mm -hmm. And boom. Well, I believe, like, on average, we were used to seeing, like, 16 to 18 from one and like eight from the other. Yeah, so you're, you're 24. Yeah, you're probably living in that mid 20s. So we're right there. So mm -hmm. those other 16 touches, we're going to, you know. God, I love just, that. <laughs> that changes the entire game. Change, changes the entire game. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and now, I mentioned this on the show last week, but now the greater concern for me is where does Boise State generate explosive plays? Ashton Genty, as of last week, led the Mountain West in plays of 10 or more yards. Eric McAllister was third. Uh, the next closest Bronco to him was uh, Eric, uh, excuse me, Taylor Green, who was tied for 32nd with 12 explosive plays, um, all with his legs, not including passing, in the Mountain West Conference. And now those three guys, they might not even – they might not play. They are, totally are very team. limited, like – Totally different team. Yeah, I don't so know how do you generate up. explosive plays on offense, which is a necessary yeah. component to a good offense? Sure. It's 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 gonna be tough, Jay. Mm. I can honestly say I've never been in this predicament. Well, what are you gonna say? Let's let's uh, as we wrap this up here. What do you think this weekend? I don't even know. If, well, I don't even. I mean, Boise State's favored by twenty six in Vegas. Dad, there should not. <laughs> man, we should not be favored by twenty six in any game <laughs> right now. That's Vegas has not been watching Boise State play lately. I, apparently not. But this is. A, a, there's a lot of bright lights down there, and they know what they're doing. So maybe this is like one of those things where, like, oh God, no way, and then they actually do it. Twenty six. Uh, twenty six. The line open. Boise State by twenty six. I'm definitely going on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if we cover that spread. <laughs> I just, yeah. Uh, we, will, I can honestly say we will not cover the spread. That's, okay. that's my first On a scale thing. of 1 to 10, let's do this differently this week. On oh, a scale of 1 geez. to 10, what's your confidence level they win? 
win the game. Yes. It's might be the lowest I've, <laughs> I've said against a lesser opponent, but I'm at like a seven right now. Oh. Get I'm Shane's like, confidence back. I'm at fellas. like a seven. I'm really down. I'm down right now. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's I'm, I'm hurting with the program. It's time to get back. Um, Shane is always a bunch of fun. A f- one of my, I think this is one of my favorite shows. This was, this was a fun one despite everything that's going oh. on right now. Yeah, tons to talk about. Mm-hmm. I don't even think we talked about the defense. That's, uh, that's tough. I know. That ha- <laughs> they haven't been good. In ways, I do feel like they might have done enough to win last game. I'll, I'll leave you with this, though. Seven guys on that defense played 66 out of 70 snaps. Middle linebacker uh, DJ Schramm, who's just coming off an injury, as well as um, that weak side linebacker Andrew Simpson, played all 70. They didn't leave the field. Depth is a little bit of issue for that unit right now, and they got to tackle better. They got to tackle better. They do. I will say this. They did a good job of not giving up points off of turnovers. Yeah, they did that, and then they also – Fresno State probably is looking at it this week being like, we kicked too many field goals in the red zone. Because I think they yeah. kicked like so three they, field goals down there. They did a lot of bending, but don't break. Mm-hmm. But obviously, we couldn't. they couldn't get off the field on third down. Well, this week we'll, we'll hope they break uh, New Mexico spirits and don't bend or, or something like that. Shane, as always, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and watching, everybody. This is Jay Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community. As long as we're talking about tackling, I'm going to let Spencer Dan- Danison tell you how they plan to improve it as we send you away. You got to be very intentional with the reps you get, Jay. So the the reps we do get at practice, we're not taking anybody to the ground in practice, but the reps you do get to get a wrap on a body, they're less than they were earlier in the season, but we are still going to get some, and we have to be extremely intentional to get that work. And then in tackling circuits and drills and in, in, in individual situations, making sure our guys are in the same tackles they're going to see in a game. So if it's a, once again, some, a huge point of emphasis from Fresno State, we got three guys tackling one with nobody blocking them with five yards to go. We, can't, we have to maintain our leverage. If I'm an outside in player, you have to stay outside in. And not just try and run, like we just, we didn't do a good job of that on Saturday. So that's going to be drills we're going to work in practice to make sure guys understand their leverage. Now we're not taking guys to the ground, but if I get, if I keep my leverage, my body positions the way it should be, then at the end of the day, the violence of it that's going to happen in the game usually can take care of itself if your body's in the right situation and you're using your help so that we can not only win those third downs, we're not playing second and two, we're playing second and eight, which, um, just to re-hit some other things on Saturday, that's another part. We did a good job stopping the run, but where they were able to get the extension of the run game was the RPO to the perimeter, where instead of tackling it off for second and eight, it was either a missed tackle or a tackle that wasn't a, a, a positive angle tackle, so it turned into first and 10 or second and one, and then you're behind the chains and you're consistently working to catch up.